know Alessio already you know that he has been working uh, on uh, on um, on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces and energy efficiency for a uh, very long time is uh, it's a great pleasure to have him back since he was a couple of years in Central Superlec as a, as a Marie Curie fellow. So um, Alessio is one of the brothers in crime of this technology. So he's one of the uh, responsible for this technology to be where, where there is now. And uh, uh, before we were talking about the differences between relays uh, and, and other technologies like RIS and for, um, for this kind of study and comparison in uh, uh, for a paper written in 2019, and then he received a couple of years ago the Marconi, the Marconi Award from uh, Transactional Wireless Communications. So he's a faculty member at the University of Cassino, and um, he's also coordinating uh, a couple of projects. One is Integrate on uh, sensing, um, integrated sensing and communication for RIS, and um, and Meta Wireless. Uh, which is actually really trying to merge together the meta materials and um, and wireless. So um, as I said, he's an expert in energy efficiency optimization. So today we will see some of um, optimization algorithm for for RIS. So thanks a lot, Alessio, for uh, for being with us. So thank Marco, thank Francois for inviting me, thank uh, Christina for arranging everything. So as Marco said. So today I will be discussing about um, communication theory and the how to use the what can we gain by using uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces in terms of energy efficiency in in wireless networks. So this will not be an, an electromagnetic uh, inspired talk. It will be more about communication theory. So uh, I apologize if the like Marco said before if the models that we are using are not uh, uh, in line with what uh, that people from electromagnetics are used to. But uh, as you will see, even with simplified models, the optimization problem that we have to solve are quite hard. So for tractability reasons, uh, uh, we need to, we have some problems considering uh, more complicated uh, signal models and communication models. Um, as Marco mentioned, we are involved in these two uh, European projects. To be fair, I have to say I coordinate this one integrate. I'm not the coordinator of the other one. I am in the, let's say, the coordinating team. The coordinator of that project is uh, Professor Stefano Buzzi, who is in the same department as me. Um, but I mean, we are working um, on these projects where we really try to use uh, Meta surfaces for communication, and that was mainly meta wireless. Um, instead, in Integrate, we use meta surfaces, so configurable intelligence surfaces, and the goal is more uh, joint communication and sensing. Okay, so we let's start with the motivation about energy efficiency. Now, probably most of you already know the story, but. Uh, yeah, it's not really working. It's not working. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so. What is this slide? Well, this slide is basically um, that figure comes from this reference here from the 5G Infrastructure Association. And basically it shows what has been done with 5G. It's the blue line inside the hexagon. And the orange line is what we would like to have for 6G. And I mean, we can discuss about the numbers, uh, if those are really the metrics that we want, and if uh, we should have something more, some, something less, but there is one thing that really strikes uh, my attention when I see the, this figure. If you look all the vertices of the blue uh, hexagon, they are, except one, they are all quite developed. There is one which is really close to the, to the center, and that is the energy efficiency. And there was, that means that uh, there was a lot of talk in 5G 
that we had to increase the energy efficiency by an ungodly amount of uh, times. They, they were talking about 1,000, 2,000 times. It, it wasn't done. So it, that's not what, what we have today. And so for 6G now, again, we are talking about uh, increasing the energy efficiency and uh, trying to get a lot of um, more bits transmitted per joule of consumed energy. And this is why I started working on uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, because this was uh, uh, presented, came up as a technology to improve the energy efficiency of wireless communications, because uh, relays, for example, they are uh, they use active antennas, so they have transmit amplifiers, and so they consume a lot of energy. Instead, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, uh, at least when they were first introduced, they were called nearly passive devices. So they do not have transmit amplifiers, and so they reduced or at least promise to reduce the energy the energy consumption by a lot. Now, um, this is another uh, slide to motivate the use of uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces for energy efficiency, because this is from Huawei. And uh, this is what we should achieve for 6G. And as you can read there, we need a 100 times energy efficiency increase. So slides is basically saying what was said in the slide uh, before. It's just another source. Um, and when uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces were first introduced, this was a figure that was uh, shown in several uh, papers. And uh, it basically shows the structure of a surface. And it was presented as a nearly passive device, which means there is no signal processing directly on the surface. There is no transmit amplifier. There is There was only this uh, okay, the point. This controller, which is something different from the surface. And this was presented as the only interface of the surface with the outside world. Now, uh, recently, more recently, uh, many people in the community started arguing that uh, nearly passive surfaces, so without transmit amplifiers. Uh, they're nice, they're good, but they may suffer from what is called the multiplicative path loss or double fading effect. And the point is that when you use them like a relay, so to replace an amplifying forward relay, you have two paths of the communication. And it, it, it seems that the path loss that you have is the product of the it could be the product of the path loss, depends on the distance of the communication, how large is the surface, depends on many things, but in many cases, it's the product. And this seems to completely kill your gains. Uh, um, so it was proposed to have, okay, I, sorry, is it normal that, that I don't see the slides there? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, because it's really hard to, Okay, maybe I will just watch it here. Okay, um, so it was proposed to use uh, what what um, they are called active uh, reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, in which essentially we have analog amplifiers at the surface. And in theory, um, this allows you to manipulate not only the face of the reflection coefficients, but also the modulus. And actually, we should not talk about reflection coefficients anymore, because if you in input new power, if you have a transmit amplifier, you can have an amplification of the uh, incoming signal. Now, uh, this seems to, oh, okay, seems. Uh, several papers have shown that this actually is useful against the multiplicative fading uh, uh, effect. Uh, and so when it comes to rate optimization, um, active reconfigurable intelligence surfaces seem, uh, seems to, to uh, be something useful that can be actually good in improving the achievable rate of the communication. In this talk, I will actually address uh, the question whether these are actually useful for energy efficiency. 
and I don't have an answer, uh, let me, a definitive answer, uh, it really depends. Uh, it depends on how much energy you need to build these uh, things. And there was a question this morning, I guess, I don't remember for, from whom, um, if, what is the impact of the additional energy that needs to be used when you want your surface to be active? Because, of course, there is, first of all, you, are, you need to have an amplifier that inputs some radio frequency energy to amplify the signal. And you also have one more component, which is the transmit amplifier, which consumes static energy. So both radio frequency energy and static energy are increased. And yes, you get a higher rate, but then you also get a higher power consumption. And the energy efficiency is the ratio between these two things. And it's not clear whether uh, this is better than what you get without the amplifiers. And so the study that, that I will present is just one, one of the lines of investigations that we are working on in, in uh, in casino, and it's uh, understanding what is the level of, of energy efficiency that we can get with uh, active surfaces, and comparing it to what you would get with a nearly passive one. And we will see that depending on the additional power consumption that you have due to the active components, you may or may not have a better energy efficiency. Okay, so uh, I will present essentially two studies that we have done. This is the main uh, one, the other will be basically an extension. Uh, and the system that we have, um, I have all the most of the mathematical details on the slides. I will not go into explaining every single formula for obvious uh, reasons, I just try to give you the flavor. But I will try to be uh, a little bit technical. And the reason for this is that I would like to show you what I said at the beginning. Even with simplified models, at the end, we find optimization problems that, to solve, which are actually NP-hard. Now, NP-hard, for those of you who uh, are in optimization theory, means these are the problems you don't want to solve in real time. So NP is non-polynomial hard. It means the complexity is exponential in the number of variables that you have. And in this case, the number of variables are the, for example, the number of reflecting elements of the RIS. So if you have an RIS with uh, 1,000 uh, elements, it's hopeless, forget it, okay? So you can imagine what happens if you complicate the models, okay? Okay, so uh, the model that we consider is basically the downlink of a communication system. You have a mobile station, user equipments, and you have a base station, and the base station reaches the mobile users through a, a reconfigurable intelligence surface. I'm not considering the direct path from the base station to the users. We assume it is uh, blocked, and that is why we are using the surface. Okay, so... Um, Another thing that we have uh, introduced in this, uh, in this study is what has been referred to in the literature. And I mean, you can refer to this paper for the electromagnetic uh, theory behind that. Uh, what is called this global reflection constraints. So what is that? Normally, most of the people in optimization theory on RIS, they treat every element of the surface as an independent uh, reflector with the reflection coefficient, uh, and you can control modulus and phase, hopefully, uh, independently. Okay, and so if, if the surface is uh, passive, the modulus of each reflection coefficient should be smaller than, than one, essentially. Uh, in this scenario here, um, basically we are considering the surface as a whole, all the reflectors together, and the constraint that we enforce is that the total power that is reflected by the complete surface is smaller than the total power that impinges on the surface. This is if, if the surface is uh, uh, passive. If it is active, you can actually have this uh, PR max, which is the, the power that the amplifiers provide. 
Okay, and this leads to a slightly more general model. Now, I don't want to enter into the details because it's not the main point of the presentation. I just want to say that this is a little bit more general, a more general model than the one that is normally uh, used in the in the literature. Okay, then uh, elaborating. In the end, we get we can in the model that we have considered. P in is the power that impinges on the RES, P out is the output power. Uh, our variable here is uh, gamma, which is the yeah, which is the, the vector containing all the reflection coefficients of the of the RES. Um, and so we will have a constraint that P out minus P in is less than something, the power that we can uh, that the amplifiers uh, provide. Uh, after, I mean, as I said, I won't discuss all the optimization problems in, in detail, but in the end, we can formulate the global energy efficiency. So this is the function that you want to maximize, which has at the numerator, the achievable rate of the system, at the denominator, the power consumption, which is the power consumed by the RES, which is the first uh, term here, the power consumed by the mobile users, and this is the static power uh, consumption. Okay, so the first two terms are radio frequency power, and this is static power, power consumption. And we want to maximize this function subject to, okay, this is uh, basically saying that the, the mobile users have to transmit with a power that is upper bounded. And what are these? Uh, the first constraint is the RES constraint. The uh, right, hand, uh, right hand side inequality is that uh, basically limits the power that the uh, uh, RIS amplifier can provide, cannot be larger than, than something. Uh, this left uh, hand side constraint is just is only a constraint that is present if the RIS is um, active. Okay, so um, it just means that the output power is larger than the input power if the RES is active. So this is not present if the RES is not uh, is not active. Okay, so now this problem here is NP-hard. So if you want to solve it globally, uh, you will never have a wireless network that will uh, that will function because uh, your channels are changing, the environment is uh, time varying, and you cannot solve this in uh, real time with the evolution of your system. So a method that I will be, I mean, I have some slide, but I will not go through that because I, I mean, I assume most of you know or have heard this method. This is a standard approach in optimization theory, and it has been used many, many times in uh, um, RIS optimization. It's called this uh, sequential programming. Essentially, it means that you, solve a sequence of approximations of your problem. And you can prove that this converges and you find a solution which is not the optimum. You find a solution that is a local optimum of the, of the original problem. So again, even with these simpler models that we use, uh, we cannot find the global solution, okay? Now, if you want to know more about this method, as far as I know, this is the first reference where it has appeared. As you can see, it's quite old, it's 1978. Uh, again, this was an optimization method that has been not used for decades. And it has started being used very, very, uh, like in the last years in communication uh, theory. And the optimality claims that you have is that essentially, you find the first order optimal solution. So you fulfill the gradient equal to zero, essentially, which is not a condition, not a sufficient condition for global optimality. But apart from these technical uh, considerations, let's skip this slide. I have some equations I will not uh, discuss. I mean, I just want to mention one point. The issue with this method is not using it because it's been used the theory is, is well known. The issue is to find the approximation of the problem that you want to use. And the approximation has to fulfill some theoretical properties. 
and the art there is no systematic way of finding this approximation you have to try and and hope that you find the right one uh, um, we have used it and it's basically approximating the log function so this is the uh, log one plus something with this function here which is a little bit simpler and in the end we obtain this optimization problem here so this is the approximate version of the global energy efficiency maximization okay and uh, this can be solved now again if you are familiar with optimization theory you may see that this can be solved but uh, i don't want to uh, bore you with the details uh, this can be solved, let's say, with polynomial complexity. This is not exponential anymore. And to solve, to, to, to find an optimized uh, RIS, so the, the vector gamma here, that is the RIS uh, coefficient, uh, you have to solve a sequence of problems like this. So as you can see, it's, it's not simple. It's, uh, you need some work. It's not a problem that you find a closed form solution. Even with simpler with, with simpler models, and okay, let's skip all these uh, details. Let's just go to this. Um, the numerical. Uh, th there was also another method, but I really want to discuss the uh, numerical results. And there are two points that I want to show in this uh, first figure. Now. These four lines here. So this is the energy efficiency with a nearly passive surface. This is the energy efficiency with an active surface. In this case, if you look at the y-axis, this is a little bit higher than this. But I will come back to this in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, what I want to highlight from this slide here is actually that the all lines except the black ones are coming from optimization algorithms. So we the, there's an algorithm algorithm behind which provided you opt, near optimal or optimized phase shifts, reflection coefficients, and transmit powers. The black lines here and here are without optimization because you can say, okay, I don't care what you're doing. It, it's too much. It's too complicated. I don't want to optimize anything. I just say I trust me, I choose my reflection coefficients randomly. Okay. Well, you can do it. And this is what you lo what you lose. So this is the energy efficiency. And same story here. So uh, there is a lot to be be lost when you don't optimize things with, with RESs. And even with this uh, simple models. So one of the key points, in my opinion, about uh, RISs and how we use them in uh, communications is that we should really try to bridge this gap between uh, the models that we use as uh, communication theorists and the models that uh, are more electromagnetically compliant. Uh, but the problem is that when you do that, uh, the complexity scales up. And even uh, with simpler models, it's already hard enough. So this is something to be to be investigated. And uh, and there's something else I want to show you, especially this figure here on the right. Okay, what is that? Let me go here. So the this is the energy efficiency. Okay. And this is the power consumption of each RIS element. So each element of the RIS consumes this much, this much power, and we plotted the optimal or near optimal, uh, the optimized energy efficiency for the optimization algorithms that we have uh, discussed. And the flat lines are with a passive RIS. So we are saying that the passive RIS has some each element of the passive RIS has some uh, power consumption and we keep it fixed, okay? And then this is the um, power consumption of each element of the active RIS. So as we increase here with the X-axis, 
you see that the energy efficiency of the active RIS goes down, of course, because you are increasing the denominator. And there are crossing points that happen for values that are not even that high. So if, you, if we come back to the question that uh, I asked at the beginning, is it better active or passive RIS for reconfigurable intelligent surfaces? Well, it depends. It depends on uh, what kind of active RIS you can build, how much energy each element of the active RIS consumes more than the passive counterpart. And uh, for sure, there will be a crossing point. So pass, uh, active RISs are good for freight. But if you look at the energy efficiency, you should be careful what you, what is the operating region in which you, you operate. And uh, this other figure here is just uh, the gain. So this difference here is just the gain that you get. If you recall at the beginning, I said, we use a, a reflection model that considers the surface as a whole, not each element separately. This is a little bit more general. And uh, if you can build such a surface, this is the gain that you get by this new uh, reflection model, which is not that much, but uh, is, is uh, visible. And uh, another simulation is like this. So this is the same uh, scenario, okay? But now on the x-axis is the amount of uh, RES elements that we have. And we compare again the energy efficiency of the, of the active RES and the nearly passive one. And we see that at some point, so for this simulation that when the active RES has 240 elements, the energy efficiencies cross. And so the active one is no longer more energy efficient, uh, energy efficient than, the, than the passive one. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure how much time I have uh, left, but... Yeah, we have another uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so I just go to the next uh, setup. I skip the optimization part, which is not really the, the, the point. So this is just an extension of the previous work. And uh, in this case, we have considered what we call the presence of an if stopper. So there is another terminal in the network, which is this one, which uh, receives the, the signal. And we need to keep the content of the, of the communication secure. So this field of research in wireless communication is called physical layer security. And uh, essentially, this boils down to the following. Uh, the energy efficiency now is not the same as before, but we have this more complicated uh, expression. This is called the secrecy energy efficiency. The power consumption is the same. The numerator is now the difference of two terms. Okay. Now, I don't enter into the details of why this happens, just so I just want to say that, uh, like, there's the capacity introduced by Shannon. Shannon also introduced the secrecy capacity, which is related to this uh, numerator here. Uh, so we get similar optimization problems. We can solve them with similar techniques. So let's just go to the numerical uh, results. And uh, again, you can see what uh, I was mentioning before. So in this plot on the left, this is what you lose if you don't optimize, okay? And here it's the same plot as before where we increase the power consumption of the uh, RES uh, element of the uh, static power, power consumption of each active RES element. And we keep constant the uh, RES uh, power consumption of each passive RES element. And we see that at some point there is a crossing. And again, the crossing point is not that uh, much. It's just uh, 10, 15 dBm, okay? And the different lines are for different values of the uh, number of elements of the, of the RES. 
so essentially, okay, if you want more information, these are uh, some uh, references. I guess the slides will be distributed uh, afterwards. Uh, so essentially, I want to make I wanted to make two points with this uh, presentation, which I hope I didn't bore you too much with the optimization details. But uh, I actually thought whether in including the optimization details or not, I decided to include them exactly to show that uh, even with simpler models, the optimization problems are not at all easy. You need uh, very specific algorithms to solve them and you need um, and you need them to optimize the performance because you have seen the gap that you had when you didn't optimize uh, the, the reflection coefficients. On the other hand, um, this is with idealized models. Of course, with more uh, realistic models, uh, this study should be, or this whole line of work could use more electromagnetic compliant models, but then you have to figure out a way to solve the optimization problems. And that is not, uh, not at all uh, easy. But with these models and uh, with what uh, we have shown here, it's clear that at least based on these results that the optimization, the energy efficiency optimization with active RES doesn't necessarily lead to better energy efficiencies than uh, the passive, uh, the nearly passive case. If you want to optimize the rate, yes, go for uh, active RES, at least. Uh, I mean, th there are other things to say, but uh, if you want to consider the same amount of elements on two surfaces and you have to choose, do I pick an active one or a passive one? And you say, I want to optimize the rate, then go for the, for the active one. Uh, with the energy efficiency, even if the two surfaces have the same number of elements, it's not clear whether you, you should go for the active one or the nearly passive, passive one. Okay, so I uh, conclude here. And uh, if you have any questions, thanks. Thank you very much, Alessio, for the nice talk. Questions? Okay, Marco. Uh, can you, thanks, nice talk. Um, can you repeat what did you assume about the channel on it? Perfect CSI of all the links, right? Perfect CSI. Yeah. Okay. So my take is that with active risk, estimating all the links becomes much easier. So you have less uh, overhead, which improves your rate and changes the. Cost. Yes. Uh, so, yes. That is uh, another problem. But yes, with active RES, for sure, you can uh, estimate the channels easily, more easily. Um, in this study here, maybe I can go back a bit. For example, if we go to the first, yeah, here, or maybe. So here, the, 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 the denominator of the energy efficiency should be the power consumption. And here, the sources of power consumption that I considered are the radio frequency power consumed by the surface, the transmit power of the mobile users, and then you have this static power consumption. Now, we didn't explicitly model this the static power consumption to consider also the energy that you waste or consume for channel estimation. Of course, uh, you should do that if you, because here we, we consider that you use the same um, channel estimation for the two cases. But of course, as you mentioned, in the active case, sorry, I don't know why this is moving. In the active case, it's not clear because, uh, So this PC here, as you said, on the one hand, it should be lower because you have uh, active RES. On the other hand, um, it might be 
yeah, that the energy that you use for the two situations might be different. And this needs to be depends on the specific channel estimation uh, method that yeah. you that you use. Yeah, I agree okay. that. <clears throat> but what I also meant is that if you don't have active risk, you need to train more. You need larger. Code. You need longer time, and so longer the power and so bigger portion of the time. Yes, and yes, the yes, power yes, yes. So that, yeah. okay. yes. But it's another study, no? Yeah. yeah but you can... Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You have uh, the other paper, do you remember? Yes, uh, I thought about that, but uh, okay, there's another work, but uh, in that case, we considered an even simpler setup. It's just uh, one transmitter, one receiver, so it's not a network. And uh, we derive a model in which uh, basically relates the amount of energy that you consume for channel estimation to the number of pilots that you use, the power of each pilot, the duration of each pilot. But in that case, we consider only um, passive uh, RES. So you, in theory, you should repeat that for active and then compare. Thanks. Okay. I have a question. Uh, are the variables disappear in the optimization problems? Are you, are the integer valued? Does that uh, add, add more complexity to? Yeah, so the, the variables are not integer valued, are continuous, uh, and that's another simplification, as I as I was uh, mentioning. Uh, in practice, they should be integer valued, uh, but uh, the problems are already hard enough if they are not integer valued. If they were integer valued, then you have a mixed integer uh, problem, and that's really, really, really complicated. So one thing that one could do is to which is actually the um, standard approach when you solve mixed integer problems you relax the integer variables to continuous you solve the problem and then you discretize uh, afterwards uh, we didn't do this here so this is just the so if you want that's an upper bound to the performance but uh, yeah in that's another thing that uh, should be included to make the study more uh, in line with the practical uh, RES models. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, it seems that there are cases in which applications for which the number of RES are not large. So just taking uh, the worst case of, of a thousand may so, uh, yes, that's another point. So, as I said, so the, the purpose, for example, of this plot here if I can, is just to show that at some point, or maybe let's consider this one, at some point, the active RES will have an energy efficiency that goes below the one of the passive RES. And this happens for a relatively small number of reflecting elements. Um, if you have more elements, it will be even worse. So it's, uh, again, the point is, depending on the hardware that you use, how much energy it consumes, uh, it's not clear whether uh, active or passive surfaces are better for energy efficiency. Uh, it can be that the crossing point happens relatively uh, fast or uh, for a small number of uh, RES elements. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. I, I was wondering, I mean, so, I mean, if you take now many base stations, a network with several base stations, I mean, you, you can have a formulation of the optimization problem, uh, uh, which extends what you have done and then what is feasible, because the real problem is yes. of this nature, yes. right? The network, not in the sense of just uh, yes. the uh, number of races and number of users, but also of the value cells and Values, uh, so you need a association scheme between uh, yes users, so sure. uh, races, and so what is the nature of this more general problem? Okay, so if let's let me go back. As you said, the model that I have here is just with one uh, base station. Of course, if you really want a 6G scenario, you should consider multi-cell, you should consider uh, 
many more users. You should consider heterogeneous networks, uh, a lot more complicated than, than, than this. Now, uh, when you introduce more nodes, more resources of the network, essentially the, uh, for example, power control doesn't change that much. The same tools can be used uh, also in that case. With the RIS, it depends. If you want to use uh, one RIS, two RIS, but if you have a larger network, I assume you will use more than one RIS. And uh, there's a lot of things that you should uh, consider. For example, one point is if you have two RIS that are not that far from each other, the signal that one reflects goes to the other one and, and back. And this is a non, an unwanted effect that complete, complicates a lot the, the analysis. If you neglect this, I mean, as a first approximation, you, you can do it. But of course, as you increase the number of surfaces, the number of variables gets larger and larger and larger. And uh, as we have heard, I mean, I considered RES with a few hundreds of elements. And there was a question, why did you consider a, so, such a small number? Uh, if you have uh, dozens of RISs, each with uh, thousands of elements, you have hundreds of thousands of uh, variables to optimize. And then in that case, even uh, these algorithms here, I don't think they can uh, scale. So you need really something simpler. And then there's another point that, that you mentioned, uh, a user base station association or even user RIS uh, connection. Those are all additional variables that uh, really complicate the, the, the problems. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I have a couple of uh, small questions. Uh, I assume that you used a perfect phase quantization, uh, that it was uh, continuous rather than the, yes. the discrete, yeah? Yes, continuous. Okay. And also about the active case, uh, did you consider that you have a passive risk just with the ele single uh, risk elements with some amplification? For, I mean, like for uh, active risk, did you also consider that you can have this phase quantization or it is just amplifying or not amplifying? No. Um... The, there is no phase quantization, uh -huh. so it's always continuous. And the difference between the two problems is just that, uh, so the, the problem formulation is the same. The, the only difference is that for the active, you have this uh, PR here, which is that is zero if the RES is passive. And then you can use the same methods to solve both uh, problems, essentially. And then you compare the solution. Okay, so in your simulation, also you didn't consider that you can have, for example, how much gain every single risk element can have, for example, a couple of dB for active case. You consider that you can have this input power of, of uh, for example, whatever is specified? Mm, yeah, I mean, you have some power that your amplifier can give you. And then the assumption was that you can distribute it over the elements as you like. But of course, globally, you cannot exceed the total amount of power that your amplifier can give you. Okay. That's so my point. question was like, you considered the total. In yes, the, the total. Yes. The yes. Perfect. Sure. Thanks. Very nice. Quick question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for uh, the very nice talk. I really enjoyed it. I was hoping you never stop talking, although you were very fast. I mean, I mean, I, I needed to say that because you repeatedly said that uh, I hope I'm not boring you with this. Uh, actually, it was really uh, interesting. Thanks. Um, I have some questions. Uh, the first one uh, for this optimization uh, algorithms, even with this simplified version of assumptions, are they uh, real time? Can they be really implemented in real time or are they still uh, require very high complexity? So uh, it depends what you mean by real time. So all the problem, basically you, you, you take a non-convex problem, NP-hard problem, and you find a solution by solving uh, a sequence of, let's say, uh, convexified problems. And then it, Every the, the one property of the algorithm is that every step in the sequence that, that you do, you refine the solution. 
So it's really a, a decision that uh, based on the system that you have, you should decide how many iterations you want to, to do. Yeah. And you do as many as your channel coherence time allows. Yeah. That's uh, And then if, if it's not enough, if the quality of the solution is not uh, good enough, then you cannot use this. Yeah. Uh, second question is about the, the direct link. I mean, uh, in the beginning, you said that we don't assume yeah, having we don't a direct link. Um, yeah, I, I th people say that this is the worst case scenario, but uh, in fact, it could not be the worst case scenario all the time because the direct link, if we have uh, some uh, uh, bad synchronization between what is sent by the uh, mm -hmm. RIS and the direct link, actually the direct link in some cases can uh, be considered as interference rather than uh, if we don't explore that diversity, it might be an interference. Uh, do you think that this is this is worth a shot? I mean, wor worth investigation about the direct link effect or uh, no? Well, uh, if you know the the channel, the this if this direct channel you know, you can compensate for the phase uh, misalignment, and then it's it's good to have it. Of course, if you don't have a perfect knowledge of this channel, then it can be a problem. But uh, I would say of all the channels that that we have the more difficult to estimate are the ones through the RES, oh. um, if it is not active. Um, but if I may add another point, the reason not to consider the direct channel is also um, another one, not just for a worst case scenario. If you have a direct link, it might not be necessary to use uh, a meta surface. Exactly. So if you have a line of sight with your uh, receiver, just use uh, whatever antenna you, you, you have. It's the same reason for amplifying forward relay. So RIS were first proposed as a more energy efficient version of amplifying forward relays. But if you have line of sight, there's no need to, to use a relay. Of course, you, you can say, I can still use it and I can get uh, a gain. Yes, but then it, it, it depends if it's worth the, the, the higher complexity. But for sure, if you do not have a direct link, you need to use a relay or a, an RES. But in, in the case where I cannot compensate the phases, do you think that the interference that comes from the direct link is... Uh, in that case, uh, yeah. But uh, so the, the point is, if you, if the direct link, if the direct channel is not blocked, uh, you will be receiving that signal anyway. So if you don't know the phase, you will have to deal with that interference in, in some other way. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, so, last question about the secrecy rate. Uh -huh. Do you really think that uh, which metric is more important? Uh, do you really think that the secrecy rate is an important metric? Because I've seen that the secrecy rate uh, will um, uh, show that the active uh, reads are less um, interesting compared than the uh, uh, capacity rate, if I remember. Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, the values for the power were were less. Well, I mean, lower, yes, lower, because yeah. you have the negative yeah. term, yes, of uh, course, more restrictive. So, I mean, do you think that the secrecy rate is really that important? Since we know that we usually we rely on cryptography rather than, than physical layer security. Okay, this is. I I, I would need uh, an hour to answer this this question, but. Uh, <laughs> It's a whole. Uh, it's it's a much deeper discussion between uh, theor cryptographists and uh, communication theorists. So the real problem of physical layer security, which anyway has nothing to do with uh, with RES is in general, yeah. is that uh, the usual criticism is is you don't know the channel to the eavesdropper. You cannot know the channel to the eavesdropper. And the answer is yes and no. Depends on the situation. Uh, if you, by some luck, you know this channel, well, actually, using physical layer security, you can uh, have uh, perfect secrecy, which is something that no cryptographic algorithm can, can, can have. They only have computational security, not unconditional security. And, um, well, they need to, you need to build an additional algorithm that runs on top of the communication. So because for every packet you need to encrypt and decrypt. And this might be an overhead you can dispense with. Thank you so much. So Alessio, thank you very much. Thank you again.
So I guess that we can take a 10 minutes break and we start in 10 minutes. Okay.